greetings. Uh, my name's Melinda Harvey and I'm a book critic and lecturer in literary studies at Monash University. And tonight we're here to discuss Marie Tamarkin's fourth book, Axiomatic, with some of its people. Its author, Maria Tamarkin, in the middle, and three women whose lives, I suppose, form the grain or some of the grain or some of the fibre or some of the sinew um, of the book. Um, we've got right at the end there, Lisa West McNeese. We have Vanda Hamilton next to her and next to me, Sophie Vibrowska. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to the elders of any other communities um, who may be with us today. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're very likely going to be touching on what might be traumatic and confronting subjects for some. Uh, all of us up here understand that tonight might not be the night you want to talk about these things. Um, so please feel free to do what you need to do. If it turns out you do feel that way, um, walk to the back of the room, hold the hand of the person next to you, look at some happy photos on, uh, on your phone, or get some fresh air. We won't mind. Okay, so I've, I've agonised quite a bit about how I would go about introducing Maria Tamarkin. Um, I've sat next to Maria at many events like this, so I know what she loathes. And I'm definitely not going to reel off her list of um, accomplishments right now, um, but you're here tonight, so I'm assuming you know what they are. I've agonised quite a bit about introducing Maria because I know words mean a lot to her, by which I mean that she's some kind of sensitive scientific scale for the weight of words, hates euphemism, might hate exaggeration even more. Nothing Maria writes or says comes out of the jar. Um, words are matter to her, live matter. Uh, Lionel Trilling famously said that sincerity is a congruence of a vowel and actual feeling. Um, I think this is Maria. A vowel and actual feeling match at all times. Sincerity defined like this sounds a bit boring. Sounds like it leads to humorlessness, uh, to being mealy mouthed or scared of life. But in Maria's case, it's quite the opposite. It leads to force, wildness, heat, generosity, care, and curiosity. Um, I met Maria because once I said in an interview that I disagreed with something she had written. Uh, she didn't, she got in contact with me almost immediately, um, and not to tell me that I was wrong or to yell at me, but I think, and I've never actually asked her why, but I think because she just wanted to have the conversation. Um, and I think that that goes a long way to telling you what you need to know about Maria. Uh, Maria, can I ask you to introduce Lisa, Vanda and Sophie for us? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And yes, I just, I was really interested in what you had to say, so I wanted to have a conversation. Um, the way I'm going to introduce um, Lisa, Vanda and Sophie is, is by reading little passages in the book that either talk about the moment in which we met or in Lisa's case, kind of talk about some formative conversations that uh, we had and that really uh, made this book possible. Okay, so I might start with you, Lisa. How's my mic? Is it okay? Am I sounding okay? Okay. Um, so, um, talking to Lisa and having those conversations and, you know, you will sort of, if you haven't had a chance to look at the book, you'll, it will be quite clear from what I read, but um, that was really um, the genesis for the uh, first chapter in this book and Lisa not only uh, sort of made me think about things that I um, hadn't thought about before, but she also put me in touch with people who became the kind of the key people of this chapter. And it is through the kind of the chain of people who I met through Lisa that I met Francis, who became kind of central um, uh, to this particular part of the book. So this is the bit um, that I wanted to read. 
Lisa, I say. It was Lisa I talked to first about schools losing their kids, about wanting to write about it. By now we are friends. I hope that's a bit arrogant, but you know. Um, is suicide the worst that can happen to a school? School is an institution, but it is like a family, she says, in loco parentis, in the place of a parent. When a suicide happens, a school is damaged irrevocably, like a family would be. A school, a school is haunted by a suicide, like a family. Like a family, you find yourself asking, what didn't we do, didn't we see, should we have said, how? Lisa, but how can a school keep safe young, keep safe young souls, I say, that do not know themselves, do not know death is final, are in turmoil, often don't know to ask for help. Can any institution respond to such a demand? Lisa still teaches English and literature, but not full time and no longer at Brin School. Brin, Brin is the person who appears in this chapter. She paints, writes, plays in a band, looks 15 years younger than she is supposed to, no makeup like Katie. She answers, um, that's a quote from Lisa again, in Raymond Gator's book of essay, essays is an excerpt from a letter by Anne Mann who tells her dear friend Ray that to really face up to the tragedy of his mother's suicide and a lifetime of its consequences, he should find pity for himself as a young boy. Pity, I'm struck by this word. A school should be able to find that pity, says Lisa, for itself, that forgiveness. I'm going to skip a little bit and just um, read a tiny little bit more. Pity and forgiveness, they're nothing like the booming, blaring, everywhere phrases. Unbroken spirit, coming together, overcoming adversity, rebuilding, shared values, vision for the future. Community feels wooden as something out of a grant application. So these are the kinds of conversations we were having and the conversations that were kind of fundamental to both to this chapter and to this book as a whole and for which I will always be grateful to Lisa. Um, I'm going to read uh, a little bit about uh, me and Vanda, um, how we met. Okay. Um, no dialogue in this one. Okay. Um, we met by accident in North Melbourne Town Hall's corridors the spring that I was pregnant with my second child and Vanda was volunteering at a fringe festival. She was checking tickets at the door, helping out with shows. The shows, as you'd expect, were varying quality. I wondered what she was doing here, this woman who, whose big polymath mind was straight away, to, straight away apparent, even to me, who was sick with around-the-clock morning sickness and not noticing much. I remember thinking I don't get the whole community volunteering thing, thing, thinking also that in another time place, this woman could have led armies to battle. Still think that. I didn't know then that she loved theatre directing actors, actors especially, and years before had started a theatre company for young people which had a policy of turning away no one at auditions. The result was large happy casts and full houses. I wasn't aware then that after a disheartening year doing articles at a, sub at a suburban law firm, she needed to feel surrounded by theatre to feel okay. And I was there, why? Involved in one of the festival shows, if you must know, in a non-performing capacity and due any minute to alight on the discovery of how lucky writers are compared to the men and women of theatre. Writers are not required to be present at their trials. That first time we talked, it occurred to me that with Vanda being a community lawyer, the two of us could even be in the same taxation bracket. Not until years later, in a St Kilda legal branch foyer, me waiting for Vanda, she running late after a client appointment, did I, seconds before she appeared, wearing black and white, write in my notebook quickly as if somehow I'd forget it. Decrepit, shoddy, falling apart, alarm code on a sticker, heaters everywhere, cold. And then deep inside that building, Vanda's office was like a room from my childhood, windowless, boxy, held together, as would say, by an honest word, closer to an empty office. Not long after that, in the magistrate's court, I overheard a young female lawyer say to Vanda, I couldn't do what you were doing. And although it was mostly clear what she meant, couldn't be so near other people's shit and misery, couldn't have the office you have, I tried hard 
tried and failed to figure out if she meant it as a compliment. So that's me and Vanda meeting, and here I am, around the clock, morning sickness, pregnancy number three, history repeating itself. Yes, I think <laughs> Vanda, yeah, there's something cause and effect there. Um, and now the um, bit about uh, Sophie, and I apologise that my reading is not up to scratch this time around. That's OK, I'll get better one day. Um, so I'm just, uh, the beginning is a little bit uh, too complicated, so I'm just going to jump into it, um, into how we met. So the beginning will sound a little funny, but it's because there is other stuff in front of it. Anyway, years earlier, five women sat at the rectangular table in another St Kilda cafe. Um, Vera had an had on a light black dress hanging off thin as vermicelli straps. And Vera Vosovsky is the uh, kind of at the centre of chapter four uh, of this book. And Sophie will talk about her and about their friendship. So Vera is a kind of the person who connects us and uh, a, central, a central presence as well. So that's why I start with her. So yes, green and black jewellery, a shawl. 79 then, and not an inch of her was caked up or mumsy. Where did you get such an exquisite shawl, people were asking. From our Aldi supermarket. It's a great shawl for breastfeeding mothers, she replied. <laughs> Come to think of it, I forget what anyone else wore that day. When I close my eyes, it's only Vera I see in colour. Though I do remember coughing the place down, the, prelu the prelude to a month's long pneumonia in the middle of a Melbourne summer, and I remember Vera with her veteran smoker's cough saying, you're really out coughing me today, which almost felt like a badge of honour, coughing like this, yet still up, out and about, living. Since by then I had bumped into plenty of accounts of Vera's legendary staying powers. A friend in Byron Bay, where Vera moved after the ABC retrenched her, wrote to me, had an outrageous night with Vera on Friday. She drank and smoked me under the table and we danced the evening away to her fabulous music collection. That's a direct quote, not doctored at all. This ability of Vera's to outlast my friend was no lightweight and I drank and partied with her and I can attest to that. Um, so this ability of Vera's to outlast pretty much everyone was confirmed that day by Sophie. It was my first time meeting Sophie. Vera could always drink and smoke every day and be fine, Sophie said. She still can. She says she's tired. These are words out of her mouth, but she can do it. Drink, smoke, stay up, be okay. Sophie's French, not Polish, but she lived in Poland as a young woman and speaks Polish with Vera. They, they met at a party in Melbourne long, long ago. How young they were then. From afar, Vera looked, like, looked Latin American. They got talking. Where are you from? Poland. In which city did you live? Warsaw. Which suburb? What street? Sophie must have told the story of meeting Vera a million times, but she still made sure not to deny me its pop. Did you two live on the same street, I asked. Better than that, same building. At the cafe, Vera's phone kept ringing, people wanting to see her cook her dinner, introduce her to someone. Vera said Sophie has a talent for bringing people together and getting them to stay connected. I told Sophie I was writing about Vera because something about her and her story made the by now safe seeming space of Holocaust testimonies dangerous again. Dangerous felt right. right. Sophie knew what I was saying. She blessed me with her eyes. So that's, that's these three women in front of you. There you go. <laughs> Uh, and I just would like to add one more thing just about um, Melinda, who was, uh, apart from my partner who edited this book, uh, the very first reader of this book, she read bits of it as I was writing, uh, as, as I was writing this book, as um, she read chapter five, as I was ready to throw it in the bin and told me not to do that. Um, she's very, very dear to me and very important to this book as well. And I just couldn't be happier to be sitting with the four of these women here tonight. So there you go. Okay. Back to you. Thank you. <laughs> so now you know us all. Um, we're okay. going to pretend like we're sitting in that St Kilda cafe and try to have a five-way conversation. But before we do, um, we've asked, well, 
I think we've all decided um, together that we, um, except for me as the chair, uh, are going to just um, talk for a couple of minutes about something that either means something um, important to us or that is dear to us. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I don't want to say who, who should start first. Who would like to start first? We start from the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I need to put my specs on. <laughs> Creativity, I suppose, is what's important to me, uh, which is what we're doing now. It's bringing threads of ideas and the expression of those ideas together to spark conversations and in turn inspire or motivate more creative communication, more dialogue, more listening. What's important to me is the input, output, ebb and flow. What's important to me is being both audience and participant listening for the clues and connections that will help me make a little more sense of the confronting and confusing aspects of life. Or, if not able to do that, maybe at least reconcile me to ambiguity. Creativity connects us on so many levels, and that's why I'm here tonight, because I wanted to kind of um, accept and acknowledge uh, Maria's great um, work with this book, she's going to bat that right back. She doesn't want her name mentioned at all for some reason. She wants to pretend, <laughs> you know, she's not on this stage and she's not the epicentre of this conversation, but she is. And it's her capacity to bring things together, to, to kind of take threads that you think at first could have nothing to do with each other, but that do. Um, and I think that that creative ability to kind of pick up and listen and wonder, put something together... Um, that's, that's sort of what motivates perhaps this book, in my opinion, and it motivates me in conversations with other people. So tonight, listening to these three, you know, little bits of axiomatic that Maria has read, it occurred to me that some of you might be wondering, but what's this book about? And you'll have to read it because you will make the connections to work out what this book is about. Maria is the most generous writer in the world. She actually expects your participation and your honesty. So for me that's the creative process and in my couple of minutes um, I wanted to talk about that because uh, I guess um, I don't think any community can live without creativi creativity, without that honesty of uh, the wondering of how we're going to kind of put together the threads of what we understand and, and make something of them. And uh, for me that this book is a kind of example of that, a series of meetings, conversations, understandings and puttings together of what seem to be disparate uh, the traumas. But, of course, in the aftermath of every trauma is the question, what next? And I think Maria has asked that of, of everybody in the book. Uh, so that is my contribution to what's important. Thanks, Lisa. Banda? Mm. Um, the, so the title of um, the chapter that Maria wrote about, um, not so much about me, but my clients and, and their lives, um, history repeats itself. And uh, we, we hear that many times and it's um, taken from a, a George Santayana observation, um, an early 20th century philosopher, which I think went something along the lines of um, those that don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And we hear that... Um, you know, sort of made into many different quotes. And one of the ones is those who don't remember history are, are doomed to repeat it. And it occurred to me um, in, in reading that chapter and, and in my everyday um, uh, work with people, and particularly with the reflection of time um, when, since we started this 12 years ago, it's hard to believe that um, uh, 12 years ago social media was in its infancy. Um, but if there's one thing that social media reminds us, it's that um, history may well repeat itself if, you're, if you don't remember it, but you're forced to remember it um, all the time, quite often. And for the people I work with, they have no choice. They're forced to remember it. They're forced to remember it every time that they have to go into an agency and tell their story again and again and again and again until the traumas that they have suffered become nothing more than the currency that they use and that they need to get 
what should be given to them because it's a human right and not because they have to pay for it with the blood from their lives. They're forced to remember it because when they go for a job, that theft, that um, solicit for um, sex, that, uh, that um, minor begging charge, all of those things will come up. Um, if if, if um, they're unlucky, um, and most people are because that's what police checks do, and indeed it puts people off going for jobs. So they remember their past all the time. It's forced on them and, and we force it on them. And the, the lack of forgiveness, the lack of generosity, the lack of redemption, of allowing redemption, of allowing for people to have made mistakes and have moved on from them is something that I find extremely concerning and something that I, I mourn every day. And I sometimes wonder whether the loss of religion for all the good that that does us has also meant that we've lost something in terms of how we learn to forgive and allow people to move on. And it's um, a thing that you learn very early on when uh, you do criminal law, which is that we cannot punish people beyond what the court says that they're meant to be punished. So therefore, if, um, say, for instance, someone served a jail sentence and for some reason they didn't get let out on the day that um, their jail sentence ended, then they will get compensation from the government. And yet society says, actually, no, you're going to be punished for the rest of your life for that. And what's more, you're not going to be punished in proportion to the crime that you committed. So, for instance, the crime of theft um, in the Victorian um, Crimes Act, uh, the maximum sentence is 15 years. Clearly, if you do a shop steal, you're not going to get 15 years in jail. Probably you're going to get an undertaking to be of good behaviour if it's, you know, a few items or whatever. But you're going to have that on your criminal record probably for the rest of your life um, because we don't have a 10-year um, period like a lot of other states do where um, minor matters then get shoved to one side and you start again with a, a, fresh, a fresh plate. Um, and in the same way that the person who steals hundreds of thousands of dollars will have that. There's no discrimination in that. And yet for, for judges, for courts, for us um, uh, advocating for our clients, proportionality is extremely important, but not in the wider society. It's not. And so one of the things that I said at the launch of the book is that if you are involved in um, any way in being able to hire people, in somehow being able to place them into positions where they may be able to get back a sense of being involved in the community, you need to interrogate yourself and your organisation about what your policies are, about employing people. Indeed, there are even organisations who should know better, who will not allow people to volunteer if they have a criminal record. They'll happily take their slave labour um, on work for the dole schemes or on community corrections orders, but they will not let them volunteer. And we can all have a part in talking about that. We can all have a part in talking to our friends and family about what it means to allow people to move on. Um, and yes, that is something that's very dear to me. I spent today in a jail, I spend every um, second Wednesday in a jail um, uh, talking to clients and uh, dealing with the things that people can't get help with in, in jail, can't get legal help with. And, and so it's very close to me today. Maybe. Maybe Sophie should go because mine is more about writing and sure, that could okay. tie in yes. with yeah. your okay, Sophie. discussion. Yeah. 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 So uh, I am going to speak about my friend Vera, uh, and she comes a bit uh, to, to, towards the end of the book, and her situation is different from Vanda's clients. Uh, she is a. Uh, uh, Holocaust child survivor, uh, as Maria say, uh, like no other that uh, Maria has met. So uh, Maria told the story how I met Vera in Melbourne and we found out that we lived in the same building in Warsaw many years before. 
So Maria asked the question, uh, is there something unique uh, that we are born with? Uh, no, not even preverbal, uh, prenatal. And she speaks about different uh, uh, kinds of time. Uh, she writes about linear time that turns out to be cyclic. And this is a big theme of the book, uh, uh, the time of history, repetition, and trauma. We, we think that we move into the future, uh, but we find ourselves uh, back in the past. Uh, however, there is also the, the, the vertical time. It's time redirected into depth. And there, as products of history, we can try to make sense of it. Most uh, Holocaust accounts explore uh, effects, uh, causes and effects of trauma. Uh, Maria uh, tries to understand uh, what helped Vera to survive during the war, Lvov ghetto and even worse outside it. And after the war, what uh, helped Vera to survive in a different sense? Uh, remaining open to life uh, with lots of energy, color, brightness, no bullshit, often giving you a difficult time over the top. <laughs> Struggling to, to maintain that but managing somehow. And there is a poem in the book by a Polish poet who received the Nobel Prize, Wisława Szymborska, and it's about, it's about an animal, a holothorian called, who in danger divides in two. It allowed one part to die so that the other part can grow into a hole. Not long after the war, still in Warsaw, Vera became part of quite an extraordinary group of uh, highly imaginative, intelligent and daring artists and writers who fought uh, the Stalinist regime after Hitler, Stalin. And they did it with uh, bohemian excesses and uh, means that were both political and poetic. Vera said that when she came later to Australia, people pitied her. Oh, poor you, you come from this backward Poland. And Vera, speaking again, little did they know that a few streets in Warsaw, shining with the need for freedom, were brighter than anywhere else in the world. And Maria describes how Vera came to Australia with the spirit and remained true to it uh, through quite a number of new beginnings, endings, and new beginnings again. She uses a metaphor uh, from the Kabbalah, uh, who is important, which is important to Vera, uh, at creation, uh, so the story goes, God filled ten vessels with divine light, and most of them could not contain this light and shattered. They spilled into matter with uh, brokenness and division. Uh, we are those shards, Maria suggests. We are spilling those who came before us. We are carriers of history and its trauma. Uh, however, in the story from Kabbalah, uh, there, is also, there are also sparks of knowledge and understanding that comes from higher vessels which didn't break. And this is where lies a possibility of uh, repair and redemption. Uh, there, is, there is no final explanation about Vera, no putting in, in a box. Uh, 
the, the, the book happens in a, in a zone of, of reaching towards a language that can acknowledge that and towards touching upon something in our nature, as Maria says, uh, quoting Heraclitus, uh, which is hidden and yet wants to be known. The final chapter of the book is about Maria herself and her friend who stayed in Ukraine. And the story is told against the background of collapse of the Soviet Union. And it is friendship that gets the last word, not the tragic and puzzling events of recent history. Maria. So I've just, um, sorry, I'm reading you three eloquent women. Um, so this, this just um, a little bit of my reflections on being a non-fiction writer and writing, writing about people, real people and real lives and real friendships. Uh, <clears throat> listening to the recording of your voice never feels quite right. It's not vanity, no. Something invariably gets distorted, gobbled up in transmission. I knew well a couple of people who had been profiled on the Australian story over the years. And what can I say? Not even close. I wonder what it's like to be written about in a book like mine. Another person, how not to get them painfully wrong. Misrepresentation doesn't just happen at the level of facts, a meeting something or letting the context drop out. There is such a thing as misrecognizing who is in front of you or not being able to properly see that person or not being able to hold the basic fact that this person is unlike anyone you know. So there are no points of comparison and you have to understand them on their own terms. There is such a thing as not enough time or being too caught up in the story you want to tell or not finding the language that can do the job. Some of the people who have read Axiomatic talk about Vanda as a hero, a community lawyer selflessly fighting for her clients. I never wanted to write Vanda as a hero, and oh God, the facial expression you should see. <laughs> um, I'll just keep looking. Um, it's not me, it's other people, the readers. Um, I never wanted to write Vera as a hero either. Why not? I admire them wholeheartedly. I admire wholeheartedly all the women here in front of you tonight and Vera who's not here and Francis who's not here and the grandmother from chapter two. So why not? I was thinking about the disability community's idea of inspiration porn. The late Stella Young, some of you would of course remember, talked about it quite unforgettably. How the Actual disabled people who serve as the basis for inspiring others are not seen as fully human, how they're turned into amulets, motivational aids, objects of self-empowerment for the able-bodied people who say, if a person with a prosthetic leg can run the race, surely I can run three races back to back. If the armless can brush their teeth, surely I can get myself out of that, this hall, get that degree. It's demeaning when we, when we non-fiction writers treat people we write about this way, which is to say, set them up to become hope mascots, objects in other people's fantasies of self-improvement or self-empowerment or of a better world. Somehow the task of a non-fiction writer <coughs> excuse me, is to write about people in a way that makes it impossible for them to be scooped up and turned into something else. Our task is to make them resistant to the fantasies of our readers, to our fantasies to make them resistant to being repurposed. Maybe this is one of the big differences <clears throat> between fiction and non-fiction writers. The person we put in our books is first and foremost sovereign, not a character, never a character. The person's life is much bigger than the book they're in, their mind is much bigger. We have to let our readers know this. As non-fiction writers, we don't capture or conjure or encapsulate or distill. We ask people we write about to come into a shared space and they stay for a bit saying what they say, letting their smell get into the walls, breathing the same air with us, inviting us to see for a moment the shape of their life, 
but then they leave, close the door. Their life is not here. We have to let our readers know this. This book took uh, eight and a half years. Chapter one had 26 drafts. Thankfully, Lisa didn't have to read all 26 of them. Chapter four of five fell out of me fully formed, and thanks to Melinda, it stayed in the book. Um, and I just wanted to say one more thing, which is about shame. Um, Zadie Smith, a writer of fiction and non-fiction I admire, says, everybody feels ashamed when they write. It's a shameful practice. I agree. There is a lot of shame and guilt inside me uh, about my ignorance, which is limitless, and, the, and I'm not being coquettish here, about the arrogance of being a writer who writes about real people's real lives, and all the ethical questions that cannot be escaped or sidestepped when your subject is, more often than not, other people's pain. I have never been persuaded by the discourse of entitlement. You are a writer, you have the right, you give voice, you shine light. People want you to tell their stories, your culture needs you. Um, I just don't believe in any of that. I find that asking myself every time, who are you to be writing about this person or about suicide or about survival? Asking that question all the time is for me the only way to do it. Which is to say that I wrote axiomatic in a state of continuous upheaval not feeling resolved or settled for more than a few minutes. I don't think shame is an obstacle or a problem that needs to be solved. It is a kind of energy that keeps, at least keeps me acutely awake as I think and write. And the kind of energy that insists on high standards of self-scrutiny and makes it hard to get away with close enough and good enough. So that's my little plug for shame. Not enough of it <laughs> in this world. I think that's it. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so now we're at the cafe about to have our conversation. <laughs> and I'm sure that you would like to participate um, in a conversation um, with these women too. So we will try to leave 15 minutes for questions and comments uh, towards the end. Um, perhaps we can start with that question that Maria um, phrased um, so wonderfully. So how does it feel to be written about in a book like this. Um, would you all reflect um, in public for us now on, I suppose, the making of Axiomatic? What did it feel like? Um, uh, or why did you first choose to be part of this project? And um, I'm sure we're all a little bit curious to know what does it feel like now that the book is out there in the world circulating amongst readers? What does it feel like to have bits of you, um, if not the whole of you, uh, mm -hmm. out there um, meeting readers? Personally, I don't recognise myself in the book at all. So I feel that, uh, you know, that, that when you um, contribute to a conversation with a writer, um, you know, with the best intent of the writer to, you know, whatever it is writers do, it's it's a version of you that I don't really feel um, represents me anymore. It did then. It's my voice. It was recorded by Maria. It was uh, kind of used by her and it has to be shaped. There has to be things left out. There have to be things added on that I have no knowledge of because it's not my impression, it's the writer's, it was Maria's. And when I read it, I, I, you know, my cheeks just burned and I thought, but that's not me and I don't even remember saying those things. Many of the things I don't actually remember saying, but I must have. And so that was curious and I thought, well, which me said that? Um, and, um, you know, I sort of half drafted an email or thought about an email saying, change my name, change this, change that, because I thought the ideas were important, but I had to feel that um, it wasn't actually me. Um, and then I just let all of that go and thought, oh, it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, because it's a version of me. And then it becomes, I think, a version of the reader as they take on what is in this book. They'll make those connections that I mentioned before. So in a way, I, I feel that, you know, with, the, with all of that earnest intent of the non-fiction writer not to make it up, of course they do. And I, I kind of am okay with that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> what's it matter, really? There's another truth being told here that I might not regard as 
literally true when it comes to me. It's a more important truth that's been eked and eked from these various conversations and put together. So, yeah, that's I, I, um, non-recognition and, and gasping and, and that sort of thing was, was my reaction. And yet, if I read the chapter as if it's about another person, or not, it's not even about me anyway at all. But if it were a chapter that had been generated through a conversation with another person called Lisa, I just uh, can read it with a lot more interest. Um, you, Vandit, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to speak for you a little bit because you mentioned something that I found as well, that um, I felt I'm a fraud being on this uh, panel because... While Marie and I had so many interesting, have had so many interesting conversations over the years of our friendship, this was just one of them. She could write a thousand books <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, then say to me eight and a half years later, I wrote the book, here's the book. I'm thinking, what book? <laughs> oh, wow, that book. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, but our conversations could have, um, you know, given rise to many different conversations to many different books. Yeah, so um, I just want to make it clear. I didn't say Lisa was a fraud. I said I was. Ah. Okay. She was just taking that on board. Um, <laughs> unlike Lisa, I know which me was speaking. It was two red wines me as a general rule. <laughs> this is very, very cunning of you, Maria. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, though, um, that for me this was really about a, a voice not of the people that I work and I'm proud to work for, but but for them because, I mean, you, you interviewed quite a few of them, didn't you? But it was more observations rather than uh, uh, about those interviews rather than those interviews that, that came through. And and I think that that the, their, their lives are spelt out very powerfully and very with with generosity and beauty. Um, and, and that's what's important. I mean, me, I just think I come across as a wanker. But... <laughs> You, which is not unusual, um, but you know, I, I, I think that there's so much that is dense and real about my clients. I'm so, I'm so proud it's out there because I hope that people learn something and and feel something for. I'm just trying to think. There's a Vietnamese um, term that translates as the dust of the street, and you know that sometimes that's how so many of those clients are seen. And I, I think that um, because we both dealt with Tracy's death, it was kind of pivotal, wasn't it, in, in, in a lot of ways because it brought together a lot of the themes. Um, so Tracy um, was a sex worker. Uh, she's a beautiful woman. Um, I was very fond of her. And she was murdered in her in her van, um, and that was kind of halfway through when we were talking, wasn't it? And and I guess that she was kind of the distillation of of a lot of the a lot of the traumas that many of the clients had. Yeah, I I don't know that I'm explaining that well, but it it yeah, mm. it was hard, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. It's it's about those people. It's it's not about me. And and so I don't. I I I personally don't feel that anything that I have put out there or or who I am, you know, um, like it or dislike it. I kind of don't care. But don't forget who the people that I work with are. Yeah, yeah it's also that I think anyway that you would say that. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it shows through the writing that you would say that tonight. Yes. Yes. So I, I feel the same about the chapter about Vera. It's about Vera. And uh, so, so I, I do appear a little bit, uh, but, but it, it's, all, it's all, even my appearance is about Vera. And the, the, the chapter and reflection is about Vera. So, but the effect it had on me, because when, it, when you have a friend, and you've had this friend for a long, long time, uh, you meet and, and you discuss uh, current events, whatever happens in our life, in the world, some 
what uh, what what film to see, what what uh, what uh, books we 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 have read, whatever. It's just current uh, current things. But when when we started discussing uh, ideas for Maria's book, uh, gradually uh, the bigger picture that of course uh, glimpses. Uh, comes through from time to time. Uh, gradually, it became uh, something uh, of which I was more aware. Uh, that, that Vera is is what she has been through, and that and that she whatever details of every day that we that we are living together, it is an expression of. Uh, of of what what she what she's been through and and how she wants to situate herself in in history, if I if I can move to, to that level, so uh, and and there was a, a an unexpected turn of events uh, because of those eight and a half years that uh, Maria put into the book. Meantime, after a number of those years, uh, Vera uh, wrote a book of her own. So, uh, so uh, thousands and thousands of words and, uh, that Maria wrote uh, were already were, were said by the source, by Vera herself. So uh, Maria uh, went through a moment of despair about uh, what what she had written and what she could say about Vera, and we we supported her in no 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 on the contrary, Vera uh, uh, wrote the testimony. Now you can write the real thing, <laughs> and, uh, and and this is what what happened. This is what happened. So so uh, Vera, supported by Maria, is offering now. Through her very individual and uh, specific life and experience, she's offering, I, I won't say a model, but nevertheless, a possibility of, uh, of responding to trauma in, in, in a life choosing way. Mm. And I got it, and I'm living with it far more now than before the book. I'm glad you mentioned that you played a role in actually the creation of that chapter because I think that's something that comes through in, in, in the chapter about Vera, that perhaps the chapter might not have existed had you not blessed Maria with your eyes and had you not um, encouraged her to continue writing, writing about Vera despite Robert Hillman's book. Yeah. Well, if I ha if I have any part in it, I am I am really grateful. No, you have you have all the part in it, absolutely, as Melinda <laughs> describes. I think I would have uh, I would have walked away from it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, not to give you bad big head, Sophie, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, you just okay. you yeah you made me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I um I kept going because you said to me no. Uh, what you've got to say now is even more important, which when you first said it was an absolute mystery to me. What, what on earth do you mean other than just your kind of generosity and, and, and wanting to support me? But I knew that you actually meant what you said and then I tried to understand what you meant by those words. And in trying to understand, I ended up kind of writing the chapter that's in the book, yeah, which is very different to the 20,000 words that I had when... That unfortunate memoir came out. <laughs> <laughs> Initially unfortunate. <laughs> Initially unfortunate. <laughs> They're yeah. 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 But do you realize how important it is? This, this, uh, what, what, with your help, uh, what Vera suggests as a possibility. When we deal with, with so many people who, who repeat history on, a, on an individual level, uh, we deal with it in psychology, and on, on a historical level, and both combined, so a possibility of some, somehow challenging the inexorable run of it. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maria, how do you know who will be in, um, who will appear in your books? I mean, you obviously have lots of conversations. Um, and um, I'm, I'm thinking here particularly about what you tell us about Vera. Um, you say that you come across a reference to Vera in an article and you know instantaneously that she will be... Well, actually, you say she's going to be the heroine of your 
um, of your of your book and that she's going to take up a quarter of your book. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, she almost does. Uh, so when does a conversation then become material? Mm, I, I think sometimes I know, like um, when I read that article, that obscure article and, and that one sentence that mentioned something about Vera that just, um, that just, I just knew. But of, often I don't know. I mean, when Vanda and I met, I kind of, I was really, I mean, I didn't know. You know, you, um, you know, you blew my mind, but I didn't know, and I didn't know, and... Uh, it was the Carlton Conversations, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I... I, you know, you know what you said that about you coming across as a wanker is, of course, you know, um, you know, and and I, into me as a writer, because that's that's my responsibility. I shouldn't have let that happen, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, well, here's no, a little it's guilt just been trip. something so strong. Mm. It just like just gets out there, you know. No, no, but I and 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 I think and I think I'm I I really I understand when it's my uh, response, not your fault. No, no, no. But I understand when Lisa says, this is not me, and when you say, in some ways, this is not me, or this is your kind of, you know, and maybe this is what I was trying to write about, about this kind of, um, the responsibility of non-fiction writers uh, that that I kind of struggle with because it's, it's a huge responsibility not to turn people you write about into fantasies, even uh, for yourself or for your readers, which I think is really, really hard to do. But... But I think sometimes I know, and, and and often, you know, when Lisa and I were talking, you know, I didn't I didn't know at all. I didn't think I could write about it for a long time, and I just I just kind of couldn't walk away. And often that experience of not being able to walk away, like not being able to walk away from Vera and wanting to write about Vera, and, and being really drawn to Vanda and just spending a long, long time kind of following you around and you allowing me to do that. But I think one of the things I know is that at no point do I feel like that's it, my, I've made up my mind, it must happen this way. So there is always, there are always question marks uh, around it. You know, not simply, you know, can I write about this person? Am I the right person to write ab ab about Vando, to, to write about Francis and Lisa, to write about Sophie and Vera? Um, can I do it? Can I do it now? Can I do it in this book? Uh, you know, so there is always, I'm always ready to, I'm always ready to give up on everything. Um, uh, can I say something there is uh, when we launched the book, um, the idea occurred to me that, that you'd been grabbed by an idea that it was more the other way around perhaps that um, <clears throat> that the idea wouldn't let go of you and we called it a shark you know it sort of the idea circled and circled and and when it had hold it just wouldn't let go so the, it was the idea that wouldn't let go of Maria rather than the other way around and I wonder if that um, has uh, you know that for me, when I read and reread Axiomatic, it's it's what idea is is circling me. Uh, and for me, it was this idea that that kind of uh, links all the stories, all the chapters together. How do we cope after trauma? How do we cope individually and as a society, as a community after trauma? And when Tony Birch, uh, it was Tony Birch, yeah. Um, uh, launched the book with Maria on that cold. Uh, <laughs> you might have been there. The, we moved outside. There were so many people at the book launch. We moved it out onto a basketball court on a windy, cold May evening. And he talked about uh, the trauma collectively suffered by, you know, Australia. Uh, and, you know, believe it or not, for the first time it occurred to me that these individual stories are actually not not only are they, you know, deeply moving individually and and handled so sensitively by Maria, but they are somehow axiomatic, <laughs> duh. And, you know, they we have to ask ourselves, so what happens to a whole country that can't acknowledge trauma inflicted? What happens when we let ourselves respond defensively, you know, that, that when... Um, when questioned or, or confronted perhaps with the past, instead of acknowledging it, we try to take a position in opposition to it and it just pulls the wound open, you know, these awful kind of 
diametric oppositions that just don't serve to bring the wound together. It just keeps it apart. So, uh, you know, they, I don't know where I'm going with this shark metaphor because it's such a violent one and uh, um, yet there's there's a wound in 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 this uh, in this in these series of stories and options of um, perhaps that Maria has presented um, without judgment, but just offered as a case study. Here's a response. Yeah, I was, here's another response. I yes. was I was thinking today how I would encapsulate or, or how I might encapsulate encapsulate what Maria does and the best I could come up with today was that she's an explorer of aftermaths, um, that there's a shift in focus always in your work, Maria, from the event, the calamity, the tragedy, uh, the disaster um, to what comes after. And it's something you memorably call the post-casserole eternity in chapter one of the book. Um, and I think we, we see that exploring of aftermaths right from the start of yeah. your writing in Trauma Escapes. Um, when you think about how we commemorate sites of, um, I, I suppose, national collective tragedy um, right through into axiomatic. So I, I wonder if you would tell us what it is about aftermaths that seems so important to you. Um, well, maybe it's like the biggest question. Um, I mean, I I grew up um, in in the Soviet Union while it was still the Soviet Union, and the Second World War was very very present um, in my life as a child. Um, and I'm sure people from you know different different parts of the world would have some kind of a conflict perhaps present very viscerally um, in your childhood. And so when we played games, there were games that were based around the Second World War. But also I tortured myself with questions, you know, what would I do um, if I was caught by the Nazis? These were, they felt to me like the biggest questions as opposed to, you know, whatever might be sort of more appropriate for someone growing up in the 70s. Um, they, um, you know, what would I do and then um, how would I live after? And um, so I think, I think, I, and, you know, I say this and I also acknowledge how pathological the cult of the Second World War is in my former motherland, or maybe motherlands cannot be former. I'm looking at Sophie thinking she has thoughts on that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll move on. So there is something quite sick about, quite pathological about this war just, you know, hovering over us for um, generations and generations. But um, the question of what would I do in the moment of absolute crisis, uh, which of course goes back to Vera in many ways and also to the work that Vanda does, for instance, but but also so how would I how would I leave after how would I leave in the aftermath? So it started very very uh, in a very personal way. It's it's not a kind of abstract idea. I'm not an explorer of trauma. I'm just someone who's trying to figure out how to live in this world. Have always tried to figure out what it means to be a human being. You know, um, you know when you went through a mincer, when if everything is taken from you, not that everything has ever been taken from me, but it just seems like it's such a kind of huge, qu huge question for me. And I think that's how it started. And it started with me just being drawn to experiences of people in the aftermath, and nothing felt to me more gripping than trying to follow someone's life, someone, the survivor of any kind. And then, you know, the bullets stop and the explosions stop and they perhaps, you know, perhaps you can get bread and you can get water and maybe you no longer feel like your children's life is in peril all the time. And then, and then what? How do you live? And what does it mean that you witnessed what you witnessed and that um, you survived and others didn't survive and, and all the rest of it? So it just, it, it just kind of, it just leaves in my gut. It's completely personal. It's haunted me um, ever since my childhood. And I think I just follow that um, and have followed this um, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. 
Can I ask, has that haunting changed since finishing writing the book? Hmm. No. <laughs> no. Um, I, don't, I don't think books put anything to bed. Right. I, I don't think they do. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is what partially what Melinda said, right, when she disagreed with something that I wrote. <laughs> it's okay that, you know, the, the, you know, we want literature to do um, certain kinds of work for us, but it cannot. Maybe for some of us it can, but so what I feel is that um, um, about axiomatic, axiomatic being out in the world, I feel very happy. I've never felt happy about my book being out in the world for some reason, and this could be hormonal and being pregnant and <laughs> just, you know, whatever, but cognitively impaired in some way. But um, I, I, I actually feel happy for the first time. I love the cover of my book. I love the shape of it. I love the smell of it. I love how people are reading it. I love that people I've never heard of and would never meet are reading it. Um, I love that you four are sitting on the stage with it. Everything somehow feels right. There are no compromises. I published with a young publisher, Sam Clooney from um, Cooney, sorry, from Brow Books. So proud of my connection with him and how he totally did not believe that readers were stupid and needed everything, you know, diluted and uh, needed me to produce a friendlier text and totally went with the idea that this is a complex book and each chapter is different and it's sort of, and it's uncomfortable and everything sits oddly in, in relation to each other. So nothing about this book feels like a compromise and this is a glorious feeling, but the haunting is not over, no. Perhaps we should share the love and ask for your questions and comments. Um, Maria, you, you said that um, when you're in the process of writing the book, you kept asking yourself, what right do I have to tell these stories? And you asked yourself that continually, what answer did you come up with? Or answers did you come up with in the process? Yeah, so no, no definitive an answer. I mean, obviously I ended up writing it, putting it, allowing it to go into the world. But I still, you know, if someone were, I mean, I was terrified that, um, and in fact, um, I had an experience of doing an event um, about this book um, at a bookshop some time ago, and a friend of mine being in the audience, and um, um, he lost um, his sister to suicide six weeks prior, I had absolutely no idea. And I was pontificating about how we uh, pathologize um, mental illness, how we, you know, how much of the kind of, how little attention we're paying to the kind of existential despair of young people or of other kinds of people. And in his mind, um, you know, what I was saying was just a travesty because his sister, he believes that his sister died because she managed to slip away from the professional care using that, the kind of language that I was kind of putting forward. So I live in constant fear um, of kind of being um, shown to be a fraud, of being shown, of, of the answer to the question, who are you to write about this, being precisely no one, <laughs> you shouldn't be writing. Um, why, what was that point where I felt like, okay, I, I will still, you know, the, the first chapter, you know, took me forever and one of the reasons why this book overall took an eight and a half years and Vera ended up writing her own book with Robert Hillman, all sorts of the world changed, you know. Um, you know, um, was because of that chapter and because this, I, I just couldn't find a satisfactory answer, um, which should be, you know, I've earned it, right? Like, yes, there are all these question marks, but I've, 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 I've worked really hard. I've, I've talked to as many people as I can. I've interrogated everything. I've scrutinised myself. I looked at every word that I used and I've kind of, I've earned the right. But I, I, still, I, don't, I still don't feel that. Um, and so, um, you know, when my friend kind of, when I saw his face afterwards, like, you know, just 
everything fell apart, you know, and it can happen in any chapter, you know. I was, you know, when I sent the book to my best friend in Ukraine, um, and uh, Sophie mentioned the, the last chapter, you know, if she were to say to me, Maria, what is it? You know, again, I, I would feel like I've got nothing. I've got nothing to hang on to. So there comes a point that maybe I feel that I, I can let it go. But um, those those questions that they kind of persist beyond this book being published. Who am I? I'm just. Um, you know, what has changed for me is that I'm not scared of these questions. Like I'm not scared of shame. I think in this society, you know, we're so scared of shame and guilt and we just want to banish them and, and control them and, and manage them. And I actually think you, we need to feel those feelings. We need to, you know, as writers, if you write about these things, you need to be burdened by this stuff. You need to be kind of, you know, squashed by this stuff so that every day you have to, as you write, you have to get up and, and, and find a way to unsquash yourself and, and to write. And, and that work... Um, is kind of non-negotiable. And so this question of who am I, um, you know, um, it's it's unanswerable in a sense because, uh, you know, um, and, and I'm not saying that that's a recipe for, that all writers who are writing about other people, and particularly other people paying, should, should do that to themselves. But to me, it feels like the only ethical kind of uh, path to take. And then something happens and you give eight and a half years of your life and you feel... Even though who am I is the question that still looms large, okay, let it be in the world because I just, you know, just let, let, let it go because it will, maybe I think this, it will probably um, in overall do more good than harm. So it's my risk assessment. It's probably more a force for the good or something than a kind of a, a, a an object of... Um, arrogance on my part that I can take these things on. Okay. You can absolutely ask questions of Lisa and Vanda and Sophie and, and they don't have to be about axiomatic. <laughs> oh. And Melinda. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion this evening. Um, you've made me think about the transgenerational transmission of trauma because when you talk about, you know, wondering about trauma and how you would manage after trauma and you've made me think about that and coming, I think you've said from the Ukraine and in Europe the um, legacy of the war and you're writing about trauma in Australia and in Europe or Australians and Europeans who've um, live through and with the trauma because I think it still exists in oneself. Can you talk about that? Is there a difference between the trauma? Is it the same feeling? Is it expressed differently? I'm just interested in that. Sophie, would you have any thoughts on this? I just wonder if you are a well, better well, person to uh, respond well, before, just before before starting our discussion here, on, uh, Vanda mentioned that uh, a European living in Australia uh, will have more of a of a of of, of a life story uh, connected with uh, with world events than an Australian. Oh, oh yes. white, Australian. Oh, white Australian. Yes, thank you for the correction. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, important. Yes. Um, um. So, not astonishingly, the, ch the chapter about Vera is about about the Second World War, about uh, about. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, the, the period when 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 it was uh, a very powerful totalitarian regime, and then uh, we were lucky enough to, to to leave the collapse of it. But yes, so so there is in that from that point of view there is a difference. Uh, uh, Vanda, can you can you this remark that you that you made well, about well, the I mean that w w so we were, we were talking about. Um, 
uh, the, the sweep of history and living with the sweep of history and, and being able to see the effects of, say, something that happened in the 12th century in your society today, which as white Australians, um, we, whilst we might experience it within our own families, we don't necessarily see that. And so when someone comes from outside like Maria and... I mean, it's not just the Russian, it's also the experience of, of, of Jewishness, I think, um, where, I mean, there's 2,000 years of trauma. Uh, you know, it's, there's, a, there's so much there um, and that really, I, I think, can only be comparable to um, the Indigenous Australians' um, experience of, um, of, of being dispossessed of their land and um, their, their culture trying to be trodden to the ground by us. Um, but, you know, I, I also think that um, on, a, on a personal basis and on a family basis, um, you know, if there's one thing that you know when you work with people who are in the criminal system all the time, it's that there is a history of childhood trauma. I don't think that we have yet come to grips with how 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 vital that is. And one of my dear friends who works at um, Sacred Heart says, you know, we, we're talking about homelessness, we're talking about these things where the, the people with the nets catching them, the money has to go into when people are, are, are children. It, it has to go into not just removing them, not removing them from their family necessarily, into the family as a whole. I'm so sick of hearing people's stories and knowing that of, of their childhood trauma and seeing what's happened to them and knowing that they're going to pass that on. And, of course, then there's the whole issue of epigenetics, which is a whole other fascinating area, again, that um, is, is probably going to change the way that we look at, at that. So, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I guess that um, when, when we talk about trauma, we have to be very, very aware of... of that it starts in the individual as well. And so that childhood trauma, you know, I feel for the people who come through refugee camps, I don't know how they cope. I, I do not know how they grow up to be adults who can actually cope. Um, I admire it immensely. Mm. And, and just on that, and this might be something that you're unaware of, um, uh, you might um, know that there's a redress scheme for the victims of... Um, uh, institutional sexual abuse. That redress scheme is not being offered to prisoners. I cannot begin to tell you how many male prisoners I meet who have been, and uh, not necessarily um, in an institutional setting, but in a family setting, who have been sexually abused. I'm saying male because I work in male prisons, but also because we might expect it with females, but I don't think people understand how many males... Um, have been sexually abused and have ended up in, in prison and they are not being offered redress. Maria, do you want to respond? No, I, I, no. Just, I, want, I want this to linger. What Vanda, and, and I didn't know that, so I'm kind of just want to sit with that, with, with what Vanda said. Mm -hmm. uh, well... I think this cafe is closing now, <laughs> uh, so we are going to have to uh, end things here. Just to let you know that the Hill of Content bookshop, and I believe Andrew and Jacqueline are sitting up the back ready to um, sell you a copy of Axomatic if you would like one, and Maria will be signing. Uh, the rest of us will be lingering, uh, so if you'd like to have a conversation with us, if you'd like the conversation to continue, please please come and find us. Um, but thank you so much for coming out tonight, um, and thank you also to our guests, Maria, Sophie, Vanda and Lisa. <laughs>